Mix it with my boot camp tip, rhythm-based compression. In this video, I want to discuss a technique that I've been using for well over three decades professionally, although I never really described it as a rhythm-based technique. Um, essentially, compression was the most powerful way to sort of help establish the groove in a mix. So part of it is the balances between elements in a mix, but the other part of it is the way that the individual notes flow into each other. So it's not so much about the hits themselves, where any, you know, like a drummer hits on certain beats or whatever, but it's about all the stuff in between and the way that the sustain of one element of, say, a drum kit, for example, flows into the next part of the rhythm. And in shaping and creating that movement, the way that compressors have been used has been mostly a feel kind of thing. So if I went up to an SSL console and I were compressing drums, so I would go onto the console and I would start, I would figure out fast or slow attack, what's going to sound best for the song. I set that and then I would go about the process of adjusting the ratio threshold and release time until I found the basic feel and flow of the mix, right? The way that the compression would release, kind of making the drums sort of breathe and feel like they have life, but it would have a rhythmic feeling to it or value to it. Now, it wasn't really until DAWs that I started to make attachments of these to numbers and to actually millisecond values that equated with eighth notes, sixteenth note, quarter notes, etc., or even triplets, if that's what makes sense uh, within the structure of the song. Now, when I did this on SSL consoles, one thing that I did notice is that after I went through my compression setting, say on, on a set of drums, that I would find that the release times were pretty close to the same as I went across. And this was just by ear. I wasn't purposefully trying to match them. What I'm going to show you here, though, is a technique that's actually very simple, and it will help you to really understand one way of using compression, because there are many uses of compression. But this is kind of, I've described this in other ways, called it a groove-based compression. But I'm going to call it rhythm-based compression here because we're going to focus mostly on the release time characteristics. So when we deal with compression, there's two parts that we're looking at. One is the attack time, right? The knee, which is how aggressive the ratio is applied. And then uh, the, the actual release time here. And we'll set the threshold accordingly. So if we start, for example, with a release time, and let's just go here to a chart. So we have a tempo here of 103 beats per minute. So if I were to start here with an eighth note time, so 291, I'm not going to get all particular into, you know, hundreds of milliseconds because you're not going to hear that. But if I set this as a basic release time, and let's just say that I set my attack time, let's just say to three milliseconds, use that as a starting place. And I'll leave my ratio at 4 to 1. 4 to 1 is usually a good starting place. And if you have things that are more dynamic, like acoustic drum performances where there's a lot of variance in terms of the uh, strength of the notes, and hopefully that's musical, then you might want to go to a lighter ratio, 2 to 1 or even lower for this technique. That way you'll get consistent amounts of compression. Um, as you go through the different levels for softer hits as well as louder hits where you won't get 10 dB of compression on one hit and no compression on a softer hit. So let's start with the 4 to 1 ratio. What I have here is a kick drum, so we'll start with the kick drum and kind of work our way through a few of the elements of the drum kit. This is all programmed. Now one of the things that is part of this technique is I'm going to target here 3 dB of gain reduction. And there's a connection here that makes it very simple. So if I start with an eighth note release, okay, and now I can shape the attack in a couple ways. One way I like to do this, like if I wanted a little bit more edge out of this, I'll switch to a harder knee. And the knee basically is a way of, uh, if you soften the knee, what'll happen is it'll kind of fade in the ratio rather than hitting it all at once. 
So any kind of sound where you need to give a little bit more edge to the sound, use a hard knee compressor. If you need to soften it or you need to make it work a little bit more consistently, soften the knee. And what that'll do is it'll make the compression kind of ramp in a little bit more softly. So depending upon what you're trying to do with the sound and the source material you have to work with, you may want to work soft knee for something that's a little harsh sounding. Use hard knee for something that needs a little bit more bite to it. That's just like a quick bit of advice there. The attack time determines how much of the transient we let through. If we go less than a millisecond, for the most part, it will cut away most of the transient. If you go millisecond or higher, then you're going to allow some of the transient through. So if I go to a millisecond attack time, I'll end up with a sharper, more pointed kick on the attack. Whereas if I go, say, to like a 30 millisecond attack, it'll be a little softer sounding. Right, so depending upon the sound I want, I can kind of find something. Let's go with a millisecond. Okay, and now I'm going for this target here, and I'm going to explain why in a second. If I go through a variety of different, and I'm going to apply the same basic processing to three or four tracks here in the drums, just to kind of show you how this works, and then we can go through some variations. The basic idea of setting it up this way is I'm now creating this breathing movement that's rhythmic, right, that actually fits within the context. I'm not going to use a quarter note timing just because the part is playing quarter notes because it's going to start playing eighth notes and then sixteenth notes and fills and all kinds of other stuff. So what you're really creating is kind of the way, best way to look at it is kind of like a vector of movement that's move, a release that's moving at a certain velocity. And what I found is 3dB consistently seems to make that work well. Now with most compressors, uh, the auto gain will always give you more gain, and you'll never match it exactly. But if you shoot for 3 dB of gain reduction, my rule of thumb is to always make up gain for half the amount of what the average gain reduction is. So if I'm averaging about 3 dB of gain reduction, I'll add in a dB and a half of makeup gain, half of that, and then that will usually even out the sound. So now what we're going to hear is not just the kick drum being louder, but what we want to hear is how it's actually shaping the kick drum when we place this in and out. Right, so more or less I'm getting kind of, a, you know, like a more even volume here. So rather than having this just sort of make up. So uh, everything. So let me apply the same thing. Now, there's a reason why I'm keeping all the settings the same. I may adapt the attack time, particularly for the kick drum, because that's usually a harder attack to shape. But I'll generally keep it the same. And part of the reason why I keep these settings the same with multiple instruments it, or multiple elements, say, of like the drum kit, or like in this case, it's all program stuff in all of the drums and percussion, is that what it does is it will help to glue those sounds together. One of the important things about, you know, working a mix is not just about um, getting things to isolate or separate from each other, right? So when the guitar parts come in, you hear a guitar part <laughs> and not just like a, you know, a bunch of noise or, or stuff that's lost in the, in the keyboards. So there's a bit of separation, but also there's about gluing things together. So if I have 12 elements that make up a, a, a drum and percussion bit, I want it to basically sound like one driving engine rather than 12 different things that the listener has to pay attention to or try to make sense of. So the more binaural cues that you give that make a connection within that particular element, like drums and percussion in this case, the more your brain will kind of configure them as one thing, and then the more they will make a connection together and actually start to groove together. And I'll demonstrate it here.
All right, so I copy the settings over to here. I'm going to do the same thing for this next element here. All right, so now what I have here is uh, just, you know, four basic things that more or less kind of make up a groove here. But I just want you to notice the feeling, the difference of the way that this feels with and without the compression. Right, so a couple things you'll notice. One, it tightens up the sound, right? Two, you notice with the compression, it actually makes it feel like these four basic elements are working together, right? They feel like one thing as opposed to four separate things when I listen to it. So I have this feeling like, okay, yeah, these guys belong together and they hold a very particular place. And this is the reason why I try to keep the attack time very similar or the same, because what will happen is that attack, when it grabs onto the sound in a certain way, if you do that consistently with the grouping of instruments, they'll maintain a certain positioning in the sound field. And a millisecond is a really great time when you want that sound that you hear on so many records where the drums and or you know, the basic drum beat kind of sits right in the middle of the speakers and never seems to push into the sound field of where the vocals are. Right, so that millisecond holds on to things just enough so it never really pushes through the vocal, and that way you can place the vocal just out in front of it so you still feel all the power of the beat, but without it sort of invading the space that the vocals are occupying. And now let's listen to this, you know, with, uh, let's kind of mix in a little bit of um, some other percussion here, but um, bass along with it. Oh, that's over here, sorry. So what I want you to focus on here is I'm going to play this with the with the uh, keyboard parts that are in here, but I just want you to notice that without the compression, how the drums will appear very flat in the mix, and when you know, and I've already done a similar kind of compression with different settings for the keyboards and other rhythm instruments that are in here, but. The movement that's created here, you'll notice that without the compression, it feels flat. With the compression, you feel some kind of place or dimensional depth that, that gets added in with the drums, and it also fits in better with the keyboards. So check that out. So if you can notice that difference there between the two with the compression settings in here with the rhythmic movement, 
then you can get a sense or a feel for how much more dynamic the drums can be in a situation or pretty much any instrument like this. You can also tame down an instrument by putting a longer release time on it. So if you go ahead and put like a quarter note release time, which would be almost 600 milliseconds in this case, then what would happen is the drums would seem more contained with less actual movement in them. But that movement, that release, actually helps the sound to become more dimensional, to kind of feel like it's moving in the speaker uh, a bit, and therefore adds more depth to it. So when you get into the whole art of this and you start breaking down individual instruments, I'm not going to actually put the same exact attack and release times on everything in the mix. That would, in some ways, sort of defeat the purpose. There are some elements of the mix that I want to stand out a bit forward, some elements that I want to stabilize and kind of hold them back, and I'll use different compression um you know, for different, you know, different compression techniques for certain things like sustaining instruments. That's different from this rhythm-based compression, which works better on any kind of instrument, you know, guitar, piano, whatever, that's playing something that's rhythmic, that's more than just whole notes, you know, plunking away chord changes. So this basic technique, it's very powerful, just simple. If you keep it down to the basics here, which is 3 dB a gain reduction, Half, dB and a half of makeup gain, right? Set your attack time basically to what sounds best to your ear in terms of the way it shapes the attack. And then you limit yourself to the different release times, right? The faster the release time, the more active it's going to see, the more you draw excitement out. So you may go to a faster release time if you have something that feels dead and kind of lifeless. And if you have something that feels a bit overactive and erratic, use a longer release time as a way to sort of stabilize it, so to contain the movement so that it it uh, gels together better or seems more consistent. Um, these basic, this simple basic technique is so powerful. I use it literally on every mix that I've done <laughs> for you know, a very long time, let's just put it that way. And it also takes a lot of the guesswork out of it keeps it very simple, and I would say that 3 dB of gain reduction with a rhythm-based setting works 95% of the time right on the first try. And that's a great percentage and a lot of guesswork taken away if you really dig into it and uh, check it out. So play around with this. I've kind of played around with some variations of these ideas, showing you like the differences between, you know, creating one element moving and stabilizing another with a kick in the bass. That was another boot camp tip. And there'll be more things to come like this where we discuss techniques where you, you know, how you would stage, use this technique to help to stage the depth field with the different elements of the mix. This is something I discuss in, in ex really uh, probably overwhelming detail in the mixing, um, in the boot camp that, is on the Mixing with Mike website, right? So the boot camp is a 52-week program that has uh, over 200 hours of video discussing many techniques like this and actually demonstrating them over and over again through mix after mix throughout the program. So uh, you'll learn about this, the interconnection of how it's applied with many other instruments when you start to put it in concert with all of the other elements of a mix. And it's simple, it's very powerful, it's easy to follow, and at least you have something that would simplify a very basic foundational technique that's been used by so many engineers over the decade. It's not something I invented I put a name and numbers to it. <laughs> that's the only thing that's different here. So check it out at mixingwithmike.com and uh, hope this uh, tip is helpful. Bootcamp tip, rhythm-based compression. <laughs>